And good evening, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us. Um, my name is Lee Innes, and I'm the Communications Director at the Morden Research Institute. Um, and I know some of you may not know much about Morden, but we were set up by farmers about 100 years ago now to do some research uh, to find solutions for livestock diseases. And today, Morden is based just outside Edinburgh, um, and we still conduct research to find uh, vaccines and diagnostics for farm animal diseases in association with the farming community, which makes us a little bit unique. And this project we want to talk to you about tonight is all about equine grass sickness. And it's a really devastating disease of horses. And, and I'm sure some of you joining in the call tonight will be sadly quite familiar with this. And there may be some of you joining in just to find out a little bit more about disease. And similar to what we try and do with the farmers, um, we're very, very keen with this project to try and get horse owners um, like yourselves maybe involved in some of the research going on with the disease. Because although we've known about equine grass sickness for quite a long time now, unfortunately, despite a lot of research by a great many people, we're still not sure what the causes are of the disease. And if we don't know what the causes are, it's very difficult to find solutions. So this project, which you'll hear a bit more about tonight, is to give you um, a bit of information about a new project, which we hope you might like to get involved in to help us with the research. Um, and we've got some great speakers lined up for you tonight, um, a mixture of some of the researchers who are involved in the project, um, a veterinary practitioner who has been seen a lot of grass sickness over the years, and also some um, horse owners who will give you um, a very personal view of uh, grass sickness and how it's affected them. So I do hope you enjoy uh, the webinar. Um, we'd very much like you to interact if you can. And if some of you who might not be familiar with, with Teams Live, there is a little question icon um, on your screens. And if you want to ask a question, um, please use that icon. You can type in your question. And what we'll do as we go through the webinars, we'll try and pick up as many questions as we can um, from you. So please do, do interact as we go through. So I'll, without further ado, I'm going to introduce, introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Beth Wells, who works at the Morden Research Institute. And Beth has had a lifelong interest in the horses, in particular Highland ponies, where she's been a Highland pony breeder for many years. And she's also run the equestrian business. At Morden, she is one of our research scientists and she's also very involved in the knowledge exchange and very keen on interdisciplinary projects. So I'm just going to hand over to Beth now to tell you a bit more about this particular project. Thanks very much, Beth. OK, Beth. Beth, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Yes, yes that's yes. it. OK. Perfect. Sorry, I had a little internet glitch right at the start. <laughs> Not good. So yeah, good evening, everybody. Sorry for that. IT, um, I live quite remotely and IT here is a bit of a challenge. So yeah, as Lee says, uh, welcome to our webinar tonight. Um, so this evening, we'll be giving you hopefully lots of details about the project. Uh, as Lee says, we'd really like you to interact um, and tell us what, what you think, give us your ideas and opinions, because this is a project that we're very keen that horse owners engage with right from the start. So we have, as you can see from this welcome slide, we've got very many partners already well engaged with the project. And these range from our two very important vet schools to other research institutes and universities, lots of vet practices, and very keen to have really good support from the horse industry um, and with the British Horse Society and World Horse Welfare. So we very much see this as a big overall look at the disease. Now, I just want to take you back a little bit and tell you how we got here. So as Lee said, this is our centenary year. So this is us 100 years old. Well, not personally, though. I'll probably feel it tonight time I'm finished. But we've known about this disease for 100 years and we still don't know where the causal agents are. And that was a bit of a wake up call for us. Um, 
in our centenary year, we've been looking at diseases that are very difficult to crack, and we've been trying to raise funding to put fellows in place to really start to have a, a sort of different perspective on those diseases and just try and unearth anything that, that may have been missed. And I think with grass thickness, what really struck us was that the outcome for around 80% of diagnosed cases is, is death of the animal on welfare grounds. Now, that, that's a pretty appalling statistic for both horses and owners. And, you know, it's not that research hasn't been tried. It, it has been, and it's been very successful in some areas and really sort of um, elucidating what actually happens within the horse when it is diseased. And it's, but it's a very complex disease. Um, and I think now it's becoming more and more evident that this is a multifactorial disease. So there's lots of things that add up to cause disease all at one time. We know there must be aspects of the environment. There's aspects of that particular animal. So this requires a much broader approach. And that's what, why we're looking at this partner, partnership approach. So the research scientists involved already range from um, immunologists and um, people looking at genetics and transcriptomics and sort of big data analysis to expert soil scientists, pasture experts, um, fungal experts, microbiologists. So we've got a whole range of people very engaged with what we're trying to do, which is you know fantastic for us. As well as that, we had a really good webinar on Tuesday night for practicing vets who see equine grass sickness cases and we're setting up a vets um, ambassadors network as we speak. We hope to also do the same with horse owners and we've already got a few very engaged horse owners um, and as I said the industry as well. But the big issue we have and it's the one thing that I think has really hampered the research has been a lack of samples. Um, these are from equine grass sickness cases from field controls, from controls that are, are on a different premise, and also from the environment. Uh, and this lack of samples means that we have nothing to research on, we've got nothing to base anything on. And this is really what we're trying to address at the moment. Um, so our, our one big aim right at the start of this project is to set up a national biobank, and that's what we're hoping to recruit your help with. And, and Cathy will say much more about this in much more detail. But basically, we're trying to engage vets with cases, and, and that's to give us suitable biological samples. So these can be samples that are taken when they first see the horse as part of a diagnostic, and then post-mortem, unfortunately, as well, um, with tissue samples, which are really the sort of gold level um, diagnosis. And as horse owners too, you could help us hugely here, um, provision of environmental samples. And um, we're thinking mainly soil and pasture, but also there's going to be a big database and questionnaire set up. And this is really just so we can have a really good look at all aspects of this disease. So how do we do this? Well, obviously this needs um, a really good full time pair of hands. Um, so luckily over the last sort of year we've all worked together and we've managed to get joint funding from the Morden Foundation um, and also the Equine Grass Sickness Fund. Um, and so together we've managed to employ um, a new research fellow who's Dr Cathy Gere, who you'll meet in a minute, uh, and that's for a three year full time project. Now, Cathy, as you can see, as well as be having excellent scientific qualifications, also is immersed with an equine background. So she has really um, equine um, health and welfare at, at heart. And, and her aims are actually um, huge, and, and she'll tell you a bit more about those as well. Um, it looks quite straightforward here, but um, it's certainly not. So the biobank, um, Cathy will go through with you and the database. Um, we are really pleased to see this has been fully funded by the British Horse Society and I can't thank them enough for this help. It gave us a huge boost at the start of the project. Um, we have funding for three years to collect samples, which is, is amazing. And what we're doing at the moment is to build up this network of vets and horse owners, which will be critical for the biobank's success. And, and I really can't stress enough, with, without the horse owners, and the practicing vets, we can't get samples. Without the samples, we have no biobank, and without the biobank, we have nothing to research. So I think really to crack this disease, this is really key to it. 
Um, once we've got this set up and running, Cathy will be looking at targeting projects with our sort of multidisciplinary partners. And, and our aim really is to build a really big team of researchers and students, not just at Morden, but all working together in different um, aspects of the disease, in different institutes and universities, but all working with the same common aim, which is really to give us some solutions to grass sickness. With solutions, we get treatments, we get vaccines, we get good diagnostics, and, and that's what we can see is so badly needed here. So I just really want to thank all the parties that have helped us so far to get to this stage of the, the project. As I said, it is a developing project. We're very keen to get your input and your ideas. Um, so please do feel free to ask lots of questions on the Q&A, um, contact us after the event um, and give us um, all, all your opinions. So I'll leave it now and um, thanks for your time. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks very much, Beth, um, for that overview. That was really, really good. Um, and I see we've got a couple of comments coming in through the chat. Um, Helen is saying that she follows the research as much as she can. Um, sadly, lost a, a pony um, back in 1994 to grass sickness. So we're so sorry to hear that, Helen. Um, and then Rhys gone on to say that um, she's um, organising a Grass Sickness Awareness Week on the 29th of March. So you can see that on the chat if you want to um, follow that one too. So um, what I'd like to do now is introduce our um, second speaker this evening. And, and Beth has already um, mentioned Cathy, but we're delighted that we have Dr. Cathy Gear, who has um, just started her fellowship uh, with us so just a few weeks ago. She's been working terribly hard since then. Um, and Cathy is a very experienced research worker and her, her latest project was a project involved with horses where she was trying to develop a diagnostic for worm infections. So I'm very delighted to hand over to Cathy who's going to tell you a bit more specifically about the project. Thanks Cathy. Yeah, thanks very much Lee for the introduction and um, yes thanks everyone again for showing up tonight and um, joining us for this evening um, and thanks very much for your support for our Biobank project. So tonight I'd just like to generally start off just by talking a little bit about the disease equine grass sickness itself, just in case you don't really know that much about it, just a little bit of background. Then I'll um, go over just the fellowship, which aims we have for the three years. And then before I go into the biobank and um, the database and itself, and the importance of it again, and how you can help us in the future of equine grass sickness research. So to start off, um, as I said, just a little bit about the disease itself. Um, so yes, it's a, quite a complex disease um, and unfortunately it's frequently fatal. It involves damage to the nerves of um, the horses in the digestive tract. Um, it also uh, affects other parts of the body, other um, nerves of the body, but it's inside the gut really that it causes the disease equine grass sickness. And horses affected with this generally have difficulty um, swallowing. Um, and also um, just movement of gut contents um, yeah, throughout the intestine is compromised and in some cases it's even completely um, paralysed. So Donald McLean, we have him on later um, and he's joining us tonight and he'll be talking a little bit about more um, about the disease itself and his own um, experience as a um, vet. So generally um, we distinguish between um, three forms of the disease acute, subacute and, and chronic. And generally the symptoms of the disease are overlapping, um, but it's the severity of the symptoms as well as the severity of the nerve damage that leads to the symptoms that classifies the different um, forms of the disease. And um, the acute cases deteriorate very, very quickly. Um, and most of the time you have to use an ACE within two days. So this is obviously completely devastating for the owner. You know, you have to horse in the paddock all happy and in a few days um, you may know, have to have it put down. So it's devastating for the owner but it's also very difficult for the vet to deal with um, and again we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, so the, yeah, as Beth already said 80% of the diagnosed cases are euthanized on welfare grounds and this is um, about 100% of the acute and subacute cases. 50% so of the chronic cases do make it and but it's very intensive players required for this which is a lot of the time yeah, really demanding financially, physically, mentally on the owner. Um, in those cases as well, a lot of the time they do have symptoms throughout their lives, some more severe than others. 
Um, equine grass sickness occurs throughout the world, um, but the UK does seem to be the most affected uh, country. And it's mainly the eastern counties of um, the country that are affected the worst, and especially the northern and east of um, Scotland. And um, we don't really know why this is the case, but we do think um, that there is a climate or um, weather dependent factor that um, yeah, seems to cause that. Um, but we, sort of, we still need to obviously, um, as I said, we don't really know what's happening. So it's really important that um, cases of equine glass sickness do get reported to us so we understand why they're happening in certain areas more than others. Um, diagnosis of equine glass sickness is challenging. So there's no um, definitive diagnostic test and generally the symptoms are quite uh, non-specific. So a lot of the time they resemble symptoms of other um, conditions such as colics. Um, and definitive diagnosis is only um, once the animal um, has been put to sleep and via the examination of uh, tissue samples under the microscope. Um, yeah, we don't have any vaccines or treatments available um, to treat the animal. And a lot of the time it's just a matter of really um, putting it out of its, its misery, which is obviously a shame. Um, and that's why it's um, so important to really understand what's going on. And it's best said um, after over 100 years of research and despite lots of really good findings, we unfortunately still don't have a definitive cause. Um, but it seems to be most likely a multifactorial um, disease, meaning that there's one aspect one factor um, that yeah, comes from the animal itself because it does seem that certain animals seem to be more um, predisposed to it. So within a field, for example, of 12 horses, it might be one that's just affected. So definitely there's an, a horse dependent factor as well as also a factor that comes from the environment. And now I'd just like to talk a little bit about what we've got planned. Beth already touched it a little bit. Um, sorry. Um, so, first up, uh, obviously uh, we've had over 100 years of uh, research into equine grass sickness and we aim to um, provide a thorough literature review of the existing um, studies in order to identify um, yeah, gaps and limitations um, of the work that's um, already been carried out and then come up with uh, future directions and main research um, strands which we then um, follow. And for that, as Seth already said, we've got a lot of people on board, lots of experts from different fields, and we plan on holding a big uh, crucible event to invite all of those researchers and um, really try and get to the bottom of the disease. Um, Modern Research Institute um, has already got great experience in setting up these so-called um, enteroids, organoid cultures, which are in, in vitro gut, gut models, basically, and they've done that in um, cattle and um, sheep and um, we plan on doing that for horses. So it allows you to actually, um, yeah, for us it's be quite great because we could um, test potential putative um, uh, agents, the causative agents in vitro, and um, so in a culture system and you wouldn't um, yeah, need an animal for this. Um, we also plan on having longitudinal study sites and one of this longitudinal study site um, is for moral, so there are sites that have had cases in the past and this evening we're lucky enough to have um, Sylvia Ormiston um, here with us and she'll be talking more about um, her personal experience with the disease as well as also her motivation of supporting our research. And we hope that these longitudinal study sites back from all allow us to follow the new response of um, the horses throughout the year because even though equine grass sickness occurs in most months of the year, it does as a seasonal disease, it occurs mainly in spring and summer months. Um, and we hope over these long two little study sites we can follow um, the animals throughout the year, the immune responses, as well as also look at um, the environment of the animal, the um, pastures, take soil samples, water samples and so on, of fields that have been affected in the past whereas, versus others that never had a single case. And we do hope that this will enable us to um, give answers to long-standing questions. And yes, the major um, aim of, of the fellowship project is the development of um, a national day and biobank and database to allow this um, research. And as Beth already mentioned, um, or she emphasized the importance of this biobank and what it means to the future of equine grass sickness. We do really hope that this will be um, a turning point as the, in the field because um, the lack of um, the samples have hampered uh, research in the past. 
And now I'd just like to get on to the biobank itself. So just for clarification purposes, um, a biobank generally is um, a collection of um, samples of a variety of different samples and then the storage of those samples. And then these samples are there as a resource source um, to use for um, scientists of a variety of different fields or for, with a variety of different backgrounds. And for us, it means in our biobank, we intend to store um, horse-related samples, environmental samples, and also um, case data. So for the horse-related samples, talk a bit about more of that now. Um, so horse-related samples in general, it's obviously quite a delicate subject. And I completely understand that as a horse owner myself. It's the least thing you really want to be thinking about, that the animal might um, succumb an illness like equine grassiness. Um, and there's nothing you can do for it. And all that's left really is to put it out of its misery. Um, however, I personally think that it's even worse if the animal died in vain. And that's why we really want to make sure that these samples that could be available to us, that together with your help, we can use them. And as part of our biobank, um, they can provide the basis for future grass sickness research. And because of, as I mentioned, um, the disease the animals, they do deteriorate really quickly. It's, we don't really have a big, um, a lot of time um, at that moment. And yeah, the time window is quite small. So it's something we really just want you to think about at this moment in time, because you don't really want to be making that decision, you know, when it actually comes to it. So um, just something to think about really. Um, just about the samples now. So we, as Beth already said, um, blood samples, for example. So the invasive sample, we would only be allowed to use ones that would be taken for diagnostic purposes anyway. So at the first visit, um, you know, when you would ring the vet and um, the animal is ill, the samples that are taken at that moment in time. We then also were to be interested in a fecal sample. Urine sample most likely um, be good with your health because it's um, a bit difficult otherwise, as well as a saliva sample and non-invasive sample. Again, sometimes it's easier if the owner helps um, because the animal is then um, less stressed. Um, and then Beth already touched on um, the post-mortem samples, so tissue samples. So generally we'd be looking um, for only a few small amount of samples um, so of the sites that are the worst affected. So um, one uh, intestinal sample and then one sample a little bit higher. So for these samples, obviously we do need owner's consent. And it's just something really to think about. So we, we don't want to apply any pressure or anything, um, but it'd be just great to think about because um, to us, those samples are absolute gold dust, as Beth already said. Um, and then I'll just move on to the environmental samples. So as I mentioned before, um, equine grass sickness is most likely multifactorial disease. So there's the equine factor, but then also an environmental factor that seems to contribute. And um, we'll be looking, once we can get out and about again, to um, do uh, site, uh, site visits of um, sites which premises that have been affected um, and collect uh, these environmental samples. And then they are also deposited in our biobank and, and will be analysed together with um, experts in the field. Um, also, at this point, we most likely, if, if we can, collect samples from co-grazers, so non-invasive samples. Um, uh, such as saliva and uh, dung droppings. And it would be great if owners could um, help with um, the environmental sound collection as well. Um, and then we also have an owner's questionnaire, a case report, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, on the next slide. But yeah, just generally what I want to say is, so these samples would all be, as well as the data, would be deposited in our biobank and would be available to researchers or all researchers within the field of equine grass sickness. And the samples would be used, you know, over and over again from researchers coming in at completely different angles. So it wouldn't be just in, as a, used as a as a one for for one experiment really. Um, just a little bit about the owners questionnaire and case reporting. So equine grassiness case reporting um, is currently already ongoing. So um, the equine grassiness fund surveillance scheme was set up in 2008, but at the minute, not um, that many cases actually. Uh, get as reported. So it says a general sort of underestimation of the actual cases out there. And for us, in order to really understand what's going on with the disease as well, this data is also really important, and especially the number of cases and where they occur in the country. We've also um, changed the case report a little bit and added a little bit more questions about the animal itself, as well as um, how it's managed, its surroundings, just in order to understand more 
um, yeah, get more information really and hope to potentially um, use it to identify risk factors associated with the disease. And currently, um, the final version of um, the questionnaire is still waiting approval, but once it's been approved, we hopefully um, yeah, will be able to make it available, so available online, as well as it will also be um, in the sample packs that we we'll send out to bank practices um, that like to be involved in our project. Um, so that, that's really what I just want to emphasize again, that um, we can't really do this um, on our own, we need you and um, the Fed's help to um, get this project going, to get samples for our bank and yeah, for the future of equine bus sickness research. And um, you can get involved, obviously I've explained in that as well, the importance of um, the samples, the biological samples, environmental samples, and also the data of the cases. And, and generally just by raising the awareness of the disease as well as um, our biobank. And um, after the webinar, we'll be sending out um, a link for a, a questionnaire, just um, feedback, where you can leave any comments, suggestions, um, questions um, about the webinar and um, the biobank itself, as well as also if you want to be part of our ambassador group, um, which is aimed to uh, just raise general awareness perhaps in the area where you live and also potentially help us with um, getting sample packs out and um, yeah, also environmental sampling in the future. So thank you very much and I'll now pass on to Donald. Well, thank you very much, Cathy. Um, that was very interesting. Pres thank you very much, Cathy. That was a really interesting presentation, a really good overview of the project. and. I see there's quite a few comments um, and questions coming in, which is great. Um, what we'll try and do, uh, see there's quite a few coming in, we'll try and answer these as we kind of go along in the seminar. Um, there, is a, there is one, Cathy, I wondered mm -hmm. if people have been asking um, if there have been any recent studies done on chronic grass sickness survivors? Just generally about chronic grass. Yeah, I just wondered if um, I, I think there has been a bit of work done on the survivors. Yeah. Um, so in some of the chronic cases, um, so generally um, that a lot of the damage or the damage that has been done to the nerve, um, the neurons in the gut, um, that it's not really reversible. So even after years that that damage is still present. But it seems to be um, other cells um, that sort of fill in that role and still are able to cause movement of gut contents along the gut. Um, but the damage that um, yeah, has been so has happened at the time doesn't seem to be reversible. Um, but it does seem to be that there's uh, these other cells that sort of seem to take on that function. Um, so yeah, that's um, I think the most recent study on um, chronic cases. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks. Thanks very much, Cathy. Um, and as, as I said, we're, we're, I'm seeing quite a few questions coming in. So what we'll try and do is maybe type some replies. Um, but I'm conscious of time. And I think you'll really be you really enjoy the next speaker. Um, and the next speaker we have is Donald McLean, who has a practicing vet. He's just recently retired. Um, and Donald qualified um, in Glasgow in 1979 and he's worked full time in a rural mixed practice over the last 40 years. Initially in East Sussex, then in North Yorkshire and then laterally for the last 30 years up in Murrayshire. Um, Donald has seen a lot of grass sickness cases in his time and we're delighted that he's on this evening um, to tell us a bit more about that and his experiences. Um, thank you, Donald. Hello, um, I'm I'm going to talk uh, about the practicalities really of the uh, of dealing with the disease, uh, mainly in relation to the biobank. And as I go through this, um, I'll I'll just speak about some aspects of the disease um, as I've seen it uh, over many years. Um, one of the first things I wanted to say is that there has been um, very good publicity about about this scheme, um, and I would just slightly concerned that people might think there was a rapidly rising incidence or, or a pandemic and I'd like to assure people that is definitely not the case. Possibly, uh, if anything, 
case numbers are slightly falling. One of the biggest problems we have is actually knowing accurate incidence figures. Um, the reasons for that are that some diseases you must, by law, um, tell the government that, that they're there, so you get very accurate figures for those. Other diseases um, you have very accurate uh, laboratory tests for, so um, levels of disease can be monitored as samples go through laboratories. Strangles would be quite a good example of that uh, when influenza. Um, but neither of these two apply to brass sickness. You don't have to tell anybody, and there's no uh, accurate lab test to determine what the disease is. So incidence figures rely purely on voluntary uh, reporting to the Equine Grass Sickness Fund, um, and that is patchy. And I can speak personally here, I'm part of the patchiness. Um, so the incidence is largely unknown. For that reason, the recorded incidence figures are probably significantly underestimated. So there will be more than is reported on, on these figures. The other thing that happens, I think, with these uh, voluntary schemes of reporting is you get anomalous results. I think what happens is that people uh, will report their own cases as they are supposed to do. And I think it's more likely that people report the chronic and the recovered cases because they spend a lot of time thinking about these cases. They have time to look up the website. Uh, poor, unfortunate the cases which go within 24, 48 hours. People don't usually have time to think about that. And I noticing Kathy's figures there for um, the 80 percent uh, death rate. Um, I would say um, as a practitioner in the field, I'm afraid that is, is quite a, a low figure. My own figure would be certainly above 90%. I think that's just an anomaly though. So at the last meeting, um, uh, one of the vets agreed with me from Scotland that she thought the, um, the, the figures were going down. So that's uh, nice for um, the horse population. I'm a little bit concerned um, about this winter because in the northeast of Scotland we have had uh, what is a, a normal winter for us, uh, which means cold, lots of snow cover. Um, thank you, Kathy. That's perfect. And um, so this is a normal winter for us, uh, or was in, the, in days gone by, much less so now. And that's some of our own horses there. And with the dog helping in the foreground, as he always does. One other thing to point out about this slide is the Palomino in the foreground is actually a survivor. He had it about 16 years ago and got better. I would say um, that because of these figures, I'm just a little bit concerned that people may say, my, my horse didn't survive. Did I do something wrong? Did I not nurse it properly? And the answer is, is clearly no, you didn't. The biggest determinant of whether the horse survives or not, the amount of damage which was done in the nervous tissue internally at the beginning. So if they got a lot of damage, I'm afraid nothing will save them, no amount of nursing. So if your horse has died, you should certainly not feel guilty. You are very much in the majority. Don't worry about it. So I'm just going to move on to a little bit to, to the, the samples. Um, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. We are, we are not allowed um, in, in this study to take samples which we would not use um, otherwise for normal diagnosis in the live horse. In almost every case, I think uh, when we would go out and see one of these horses, we would take a blood sample at the first examination. Now, we, you're probably wondering why on earth are taking blood sample when blood samples don't help in the, in the diagnosis. They do actually help, and partly what they're doing is ruling out other problems. All you're going to get in a blood sample from grass sickness is some signs of inflammation, some signs of dehydration, 
nothing much else useful. At least it tells you what it's not. So having got that blood sample, um, then as you move on, unfortunately, um, for the next day or possibly two, three, four, maybe a week, um, and, and unfortunately lose the horse, these samples are almost always retained in any case in, in surgery or in laboratory uh, elsewhere for the first few days in case they are needed for something else. And it's these blood samples that we need to retrieve uh, to go um, down to the more done. So the first stage there is, I think, probably almost everybody, not just the people watching this who are especially interested, would be OK if, if asked, is it OK if we send these blood samples off for, diagn for diagnosis? I'm just going to say a little bit more about, about the diagnostic difficulties. One of the features about grass sickness is that uh, it varies a lot in the first presentation. Um, some of them are really acute um, and very, very nasty. And the first case in my old practice was last week, but a mile along the road from me here. Um, and unfortunately, the pony took ill, uh, first seen ill first thing in the morning and had to be put down at four o'clock in the afternoon. Usually, I'm afraid they last a little while longer than that. When we say diagnostic difficulties, it often occurs to me that this may worry people as well, and, and they may say, oh, if it's difficult to diagnose, how can you be sure that's what's wrong? The answer is you can be pretty sure. You can't be 100% sure, but possibly lucky for us vets, the things that you can mistake it for are almost all universally fatal in any case. So very, very rare that you would find that you are mistaking grass sickness for something which was otherwise going to survive, possibly an acute small intestinal colic. So again, I think that's something that, that might raise its head, but, but I don't think that's something that you really worry about. Um, unfortunately, most of these cases are going to die. So I think uh, having got our blood sample, it, it would be relatively easy um, for us to say to somebody, would you mind if these samples get sent off to see if we can further the research? That I think is, is fairly easy for us as vets to do. And I think it's quite easy for you as owners to say, yeah, that's OK, I would, I would like to do that. Bigger ask is the second stage. So the bigger ask is, can we get the samples um, internally after death? Now, there are various reasons why, why we might not get these samples. Um, the first and my most obvious one would be that neither the vet nor the owner actually know about the scheme. And that is certainly possible. And it's certainly possible that some vets might not know about it. Um, even in areas where it's really fairly common. Um, and the reason for that is this has been a really difficult year. Vets are really busy and there's so much stuff that comes across your desk um, that sometimes it's a case of reading the stuff which you absolutely have to read um, and the stuff which is optional as this is, I'm afraid sometimes gets pushed to the side just to keep your head above water. I've been there myself. So um, we're going to inevitably lose some samples just because people don't know about this, about this disease. The next issue is, are we going to ask people for these samples, which are fairly invasive um, in certain situations? And there are some situations where as a vet, I would just not like to ask. Um, the situation would be too delicate. People are too upset. Everything has happened too quickly, and it's just not appropriate in these circumstances mm -hmm. to add further to the distress. So in those situations, I'm afraid we're going to lose these samples as well. 
it's going to make a huge difference um, if you as owners um, know about this um, because you will be forewarned or armed and you will have had a chance to think about whether you're going to allow that or not. Um, and if you can spread the word about to people that you know, just gently make them aware um, that this um, project is ongoing, then that would make it so much easier um, for us to, to ask owners um, whether they would like to do that. So I have a little um, consent form, which I just need to go through now to, to show you that. Um, so we'll, just where we've done the heavy duty stuff. Thank you, Cathy. She's preemptively beautifully here. A couple of relaxing slides. This is not a dead horse. And uh, this is a, a very, very relaxed horse. Um, it's like a wet fish really on a warm summer day. And it helps, of course, enormously if you've got your guard dog beside you to guard you where you can sleep quietly in the sun. Another couple of relaxing slides. This is just a, one of my favourite slides. Um, what does a horse want more than some nice grass on a summer's day when the grass sickness season is behind us and there's just enough breeze to keep the flies away? Perfect. So now if we go on to the Mr. Gritty, um, this is the uh, consent form which you may be presented with um, for, for these permissions um, to give these tissues. I will say that it, it is quite possible to give your permission um, for this verbally if neither you nor the vet has this form to hand. You can verbally agree to that as long as the vet uh, notes that in their clinical records. That's perfectly okay. Um, things being as they are nowadays, and I think probably most vets would be happier to have a form like this filled in. Um, so I'm just going to go through it fairly simply with you. Um, first part is pretty standard. It's uh, just to identify you and the horse. Um, so now go down into the middle. Um, first part in bold is that you're confirming um, that you're giving permission for first samples, which are blood and uh, dung to be sent for research. The second part is optional, um, and you're giving permission for the internal samples to be collected at the postmortem. Moving down onto the bullet points, um, th these are important, um, and I'm going to draw your attention to the first one on the list, particularly. Um, so the first one says, I'm going to actually read it, it's important, um, that the post-mortem sample collection is not diagnostic and no diagnosis can be reported. Now, in some cases, uh, what will happen is that your own vet uh, will hopefully be able to go and take the post-mortem samples, uh, in which case that's absolutely fine. Um, they can arrange with you if you want a proper post-mortem examination um, with results coming back to you um, or not. There is a, a, a little bit of a problem certainly in Scotland um, because we have a very few areas with uh, fallen stock centres where we can do these postmortems, that uh, the uh, person's own vet will be too far away to collect the samples, and another vet may be asked to do it. Now, in that situation, this uh, first sentence is very important um, because the second collecting vet will only be going to collect these tissues. It won't be a postmortem examination, neither your own vet or you will get any report back on a diagnosis and no diagnosis will be made for insurance. So it's very important that you check your insurance forms and if a post-mortem is required, you need to arrange a specific post-mortem somewhere else 
and hopefully whoever is doing that post-mortem would collect the tissues for us. The other important thing about, about that it is that this form is really for your vet and your vet's clinical records to go with your animal. It doesn't go uh, to the Mordan. All that goes to the Mordan is another form which is signed by the vet, which does not have your name and address in it for uh, uh, GDBR uh, legal purposes. So um, when the next vet gets the permission to go and take the samples, all they have is the microchip number. You've no other way of identifying uh, you or the first vet on the samples. So it is completely anonymous. And we think that is really important um, because the last thing we want to do, and if I was to do any of these uh, tissue collections, I certainly would not be wanting to give any sort of opinion on the cause of death, because for one thing, I will not be looking at, at the entire body. The other parts of the, race of the form are fairly standard, um, but I will draw your attention to the fact that uh, on, on the last one, uh, in the event that the cause of the injury is found, uh, and we certainly hope it will be, um, then the samples will be used for other research purposes. When looking at number one, they will be stored for 20 years for that purpose. I was pretty happy with that because I thought, well, if somebody is good enough to give us the permission to collect these tissues, I think they're going to be pretty happy um, to use it for any sort of uh, equine welfare problems. So I, I didn't think that presented too much problems, but we'll be interested to know what you think. And really, this is all about feedback. And this is, I think, the big thing about this um, about this whole project uh, is that it's it's a collaborative project. Um, it's going to need uh, teamwork, um, and uh, sometimes it's not going to be easy. There are issues with um, animals which are buried at home, and I think we will almost certainly find that very few of these will be available for the tissue collection. And I think really very few vets would be comfortable collecting the tissues at home in that situation. Um, it, it's really um, only appropriate for owners who are very well informed, very keen, and know what's going to go on. It, it's really something which is uh, better, if possible, done at a fallen stock centre. It's easier. Um, it's a little bit more private. Um, there is more help and it can be quite a difficult job, which does need help. Um, and it's safer for the vet. So something else that does require thought is that if you're good enough to allow these samples to be collected, um, it is something which is, is going to be better done at a Volvo fallen stock centre um, than it is at your own home. Possible at your own home, but it's something I think we would hesitate about. So as I'm looking at the time, and I think probably I've, I've uh, gone on for long enough. Um, so this is my last slide, Kathy, you're very good news slides. Um, so this is about teamwork, um, teamwork between the vet uh, and, the, and the owners. Um, and this is the, the home team here, as you saw from the last slides, they're very keen and enthusiastic. And my last message is, Everybody needs a horse dog because these two think you're uh, daft if you haven't got one. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Donald. Um, thank you very much, Donald. That was that was a really um, comprehensive uh, talk and loved your two dog um, horse dogs at the end. They look fantastic. Love to get them on the team. Um, you've stimulated a lot of conversation in the chat room, you'll be pleased to hear. But well, Kate is doing a really good job trying to answer a lot of these and a lot of people have been picking up on 
how they can help, um, interested in the environmental angle. Um, so there's there's quite a lot of stuff coming through the chat. So thank you all very much for, for putting your questions up. Kate's doing a sterling job of trying to answer quite a lot of them. Um, I'm going to move on actually in the interests of time. Um, and um, but do keep keep your questions coming in, and we'll try and you know answer them as much as we can. And Donald is absolutely right. This is all about teamwork. And our next speaker, we're, we're delighted to have uh, Sylvia Ormiston join us tonight. Um, and Sylvia has had had a, a lifetime of experience with with horses. She's been involved um, with the breeding Highland ponies for a large number of years now. And she is currently the stud manager at the Balmoral Estate. Um, Sylvia was recently recognised in the Queen's Birthday Honours with an MVO for services to the Royal Family. And Sylvia is absolutely passionate about breeding um, Highland ponies. So sadly, um, Sylvia had some bad experience with grass sickness over the last few years, and she's going to tell you about this from a horse owner's perspective. And Sylvia was actually instrumental in helping us set up this project because she was so passionate about finding causes for grass sickness. So Sylvia, it's a great pleasure to have you speak tonight. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, am, I, am I good to go? Sorry, yeah. Yes, uh, good to go. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, as you say, the, the, the passion behind the grass thickness search for me um it just all my in all my years of horses and ponies years and years and years of horse but all my life i've never experienced grass thickness until 2017 um and my uh, very first time was with a two-year-old filly uh, balmoral friendly i think sophie's got my slides coming along quietly now friendly was a two-year-old filly who was always at the gate first. She never took second place. She was always at the gate first. And you'll see in my next slide, she's actually in the second, her second head in there on the left-hand side is friendly. Um, she, uh, she came up on the 6th of June. She came up behind everybody else a bit slow and a bit steady, and that just wasn't friendly at all. That set the alarm bells ringing and we brought it into the stables. And for the first six hours, I was in complete denial of it being anything other than a possible impaction. But the filly was showing nothing bar, um, not, well, she was showing nothing. She was just standing there. She couldn't eat, she couldn't drink, she couldn't poo. Um, vet came out to check her, we put fluids into her. Two days later, cut the long story short, we had to put her to sleep. Now, we never ever investigated uh, Clooney be, um, Friendly because she obviously didn't make it anywhere to be able to retrieve any bits from her. The following morning, she got um, taken away by Douglas Bray, our uh, fallen stock company. And uh, ironically, I got a phone call from Lucy to say that there was something wrong with Clooney. She walked her along the road to see me. We tied her up and I listened to her heart. No gap noise. Heart was racing at 100 miles an hour and there was no evidence of any dung. And I messaged the vet and I said, Edinburgh, question mark. And he said, yes, to give her every possible chance. So we popped her into the trailer three and a half hours down the road. And um, we, we were an hour in the stocks and then the mare was put to sleep. Now she'd been inspected from all angles and we, well, we basically were told there and then that it was most likely acute grass sickness. We had to just wait for results the following week. Um, so basically we put this mare through a journey um, to discover that there was no repair for her there was no comfort for her. There was nothing that was going to make her better. And she didn't get to come home with us. Um, so the last four and a half hours of her life was really quite traumatic. And after that experience, I decided I would never do that again, that I would have everybody, anybody put, put down at home purely because of the stress and the trauma. So three weeks later, 
uh, we had a three year old gelding. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, uh, Sophie's doing my pictures. This is Clooney with the full friendly. So we lost both mummy and daughter um, a day apart. And I think we maybe have another couple of slides, Sophie, that if you click through. So uh, Clooney at work on the left hand side in front of the castle and then Clooney and Gairn at the Game Fair, Scottish, uh, the at Skin Game Fair, um, representing Balmorley State at the Game Fair. Uh, and then the next picture, I think. Uh, this is our three year old gelding Omar. Omar was called Omar because uh, it was a biblical year that we named the foals and Omar meant he who speaks a lot. And he actually never stopped chatting the whole first day that he was born. He chatted to his mummy the whole time. He wouldn't shut up. So we called him Omar, bless him. Anyway, um, Omar had all the same symptoms. He couldn't eat, he couldn't drink, he couldn't poo. There was no gut noise and his heart was sitting at 100. Now this picture is five minutes before he was put to sleep. Now looking at him there, you wouldn't think there was anything wrong with him, but he was slightly distended in his barrel and he had just, everything had stopped. It all shut down completely. Um, he went away on the fallen stock lorry, no uh, evidence, no, no samples left, no data recorded. So another one that was lost in the system. In 2018, May 2018, um, I went to Windsor Horse Show. I was away for two days. And on my return, I was sitting at Gap, uh, Heathrow Airport and I got a phone call from Lucy to say that we think that Lord has got grass sickness. Now, Lord was a, a four year old Highland Pony Stallion who was right in the midst of his breeding season. And um, all the way home, I prayed that it was colic because I felt at least if it was colic, we could do something about it. Anyway, I got home and sadly, no, it, the, all the symptoms were again the same. Um, no poo, no gut noise, uh, couldn't eat, couldn't drink. And again, within the, an hour of me being home, he was put to sleep. Um, absolutely devastated again because this was one of our main breeding boys. Um, two weeks later, uh, Balmoro Hercules, who is our other, who was our other stallion at the time, who was standing in and covering sta uh, mares for Lord, who Lord had visiting mares and uh, Hercules very kindly stepped in on that job. Uh, and within two weeks of losing Lord, um, the symptoms came up with Hercules as well. And in the pictures there, you'll see Jordan sitting on him. That was his first dressage competition in the April of 2018, and we lost him in the May 2018. Now, we were actually very lucky at that time to have Bruce McGoram up for the VHS um, uh, talk that weekend, and we were actually able to have samples taken from Hercules. So he was not lost. His, his samples were not lost. His data hadn't lost. But obviously, Lord, we didn't get him collected from at all. Hercules was put to sleep, but thankfully the data was saved. Um, this disease has affected us in more ways than just losing numbers of ponies. Uh, Friendly was the progeny of, or the only progeny that the Queen actually had from Danny Boy of Croyla, from Balmoral Clooney, um, a future hill pony with a fantastic temperament. Um, Clooney was a ridden pony, show pony, fully trained deer pony who carried stags and hinds. She carried pannier baskets and she also carried members of the family because she was so good at it. Um, Omar, he was going to be a very useful pony. Obviously, he was only three. We hadn't gotten there yet. Uh, and he was very keen and willing to learn. Lord, who was a stallion that we had so much promise for, Thankfully, we banked him. We did get, take him to Stalin AI in the October the year before, and we did actually bank him. We put semen in the bank, which we were very glad we did, but we didn't get that chance with Hercules. Um, Hercules was proven to be a super ridden pony. Uh, our 10 year brain plan was absolutely shattered in the space of two weeks. Um, you'll see just in the following picture of the two stallions together, uh, they, they were able to be 
fielded next door to one another. Their temperaments were phenomenal, um, and gone just in that one in that one fortnight. It was just devastating. But what I've learned from the experiences um, so far, I think, is that if you have any young stallions, it's really important to try and collect the semen from them before anything happens, uh, because we are actually recognised as a rare breed. Uh, Highland ponies, that is, um, the importance of having samples taken from your deceased ponies before they leave on the spoil and stock lorry. Now, I know it's terribly upsetting, but we mustn't lose this data. My husband said to me right at the beginning, how many ponies are lost a year to equine grass sickness? And the answer is we don't know because there isn't the data there. This is what this is what I think everybody's just desperately trying to get. The bottom line is the start line is how many animals are actually dying from it and are we are we managing to salvage the data? Take note of your weather conditions, record everything. I mean, it's just we, we would go around with a stethoscope listening to gut noise because we were becoming so paranoid, uh, wondering whether we were going to have a, a situation the next day. Um, but keep fighting, keep fundraising, help beat this dreadful disease and let's hope together we can. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you um, very much, Sylvia. Um, I think you know it's it's such a in some ways it's such a sad story, but also it's a hopeful story. And I think what what Sylvia's really saying here is that I think if we all work together, we've got a really good chance of of trying to beat this disease. And, and which is really part of this evening is to um, get a sort of team of people together involving horse owners, scientists, vets, everybody, as Donald was saying as well. Um, and together, we'll we'll definitely make a difference. So I, there's lots of stuff coming through the chat, but I'm just aware of the time and, and I'd really like to bring in our final speaker this evening. Um, there's there's quite a few of you on the chat um, have been talking about the, the difficulties. Obviously, we understand it's quite emotive um, if your horse has to get put down because of grass sickness. And our, our final speaker tonight is uh, Sophie Cookson. And Sophie is the Welfare Operations Manager at the British Horse Society. And as Beth mentioned earlier, we're very uh, grateful to the British Horse Society for helping to fund the Biobank. Um, and Sophie is, manages the Friends at the End scheme. Um, and I, Sophie's our final speaker this evening. It's a great pleasure to have her here. So thank you very much, Sophie. Sorry, Sophie, you're still on mute. I think Sophie's on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Sophie. Okay, Thank bro. You. Sorry, let me just share. Is my screen being shared as well? Can you see my presentation? Okay. Can you put it in presentation mode? That's it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, to Morden for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, unfortunately, it's about a, a devastating subject, which I think, Sylvia, that was a really emotive um, story that you've given us. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, Friends at the End, which is a support service that we have for horse owners. Um, Beth and Cathy already this evening have highlighted that 80% of horses that are diagnosed with equine grass sickness are sadly put to sleep on welfare grounds. So any way that we as the BHS can support horse owners through that really, really tough um, and, and horrible time, that's what I'm just here to give you an overview about um, because we do have some support for, for you. So I'm going to talk um, briefly about grief uh, surrounding that because it's something that I don't think is always recognised with horse owners. Um, you know, it can be that members of the public might not recognise how much of an impact um, our, our horses and our, our loved animals can, what it, impact it has on us when they pass away. I'm going to talk a little bit about Friends at the End, which is our support service for owners. Um, and then there are some other support mechanisms out there. Um, so just to let you know that you, you're not totally alone if this does happen to you. 
So something that is quite common for horse owners to experience is something called anticipatory grief. So this is grief actually before the loss happens. Um, and this might be more common when that we're maybe considering having an elderly horse put to sleep or on horse with um, a chronic disease, maybe. Um, and this is really important that if at this time this is happening to you, you can have some support before um, that actual time of, of the death occurs. Something that I think is really important to understand and take into account with equine grass sickness is that unfortunately um, that might not happen that there's any of the anticipatory grief. There might be a sudden death because of equine grass sickness um, and that can lead to complicated grief, um, really, really strong sudden feelings um, of grieving that loss. Um, complicated grief can be long lasting, it can be difficult to get over and, and to deal with and, and really some people can struggle moving forward when they've had to deal with a, a sudden loss. So it's something that definitely needs to be taken seriously and, and we need to give compassion to ourselves and and one another if we've experienced something like that. So um, something that we can absolutely do to support owners, um, there I've put that you, are, you do need to be um, informed so that you can know the options that are available to you. This is why I think it's really brilliant that tonight's webinar talks you through those steps of, um, of the biobank, what would be needed from you and your horse if your horse does need to be put to sleep um, because of grass sickness. Um, so it's it's really, really great that we've got this information here tonight. And, you know, I can see that there's lots of you using the, the Q&A box as well. So um, pet loss, as I said, I don't think that everyone understands how much of an impact it has upon us as owners um, when our, our pets die. And, um, going to talk about horses specifically here, um, but there's now so much research that has shown that they're the same rate, range of emotions is felt when a human family member dies um, as when a pet also dies. So there's absolutely no need for horse owners to feel that they need to, to get over it. We quite often hear that maybe people that are trying to comfort them are say, oh, it's only a horse or oh, you gave them a good life. Um, and that doesn't actually support or help in any way at all. Um, something that a, a piece of research that I found particularly interesting is um, here um, where it says the perceived strength of the bond. So that's how close you feel with your animal um, does have a direct correlation to the severity of the grief that's felt after the death of the animal. So really, the closer that you feel to them, the stronger that you're going to feel that loss, which a lot of us, I think, would agree with. Um, but that does also mean that animals that have lots of roles within our lives we're going to have a stronger bond with them um, and they are going to be missed the most so we all know that horses aren't just a pet they're a lifestyle they're a family member um, even though they don't live in our house that they're, they're very much part of the the family so um, their loss is going to be really really severely felt so something that we need to take into consideration when we're supporting people is just understanding the different ways that people grieve. Um, men and women have completely different grieving processes uh, generally, it's not always, but I think it's quite important for people to also understand this, maybe if they've got a partner that's grieving and that's of a different sex to them, they might have a completely different way of grieving. Um, and it's quite interesting that for men, the death of a pet is usually equivalent to the loss of a close friend, not always. Um, but for women, the death of a pet can actually be similar to the loss of contact with adult children. So sometimes that, that grief and that loss can be felt a lot more by women than men. As I said, that's, that's just a generalization, but something that I think is important to remember. Um, and something that I wanted to, to touch on was, was Donald spoke about it earlier, um, saying about feeling guilty if your horse does does die because of grass sickness, feeling maybe that you haven't done enough. That's something that I hear an awful lot from owners. Um, and just to let you know that it's a completely normal part of grief, part of the grieving process. Um, and it's really horrible to feel guilty around your, your pet's death, but um, it's absolutely not your fault. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of give you that um, 
I suppose a bit of support really to, to know that. So then just moving on to the British Horse Society, which is who I work for and our scheme Friends at the End, um, which is by far my, my favourite thing that we do. Um, so we launched it in January 2013 um, and it's really because we wanted to uh, make sure that owners had all the support that they needed, at possibly, probably the most difficult time of owning a horse. So it's a service that means we're there before, during and after the process of losing a horse, whether that is due to sudden death or whether it's a planned euthanasia that you, that you know has been coming up for some time. Um, we will talk to you if you're maybe struggling with the decision to have your horse put to sleep. You're not quite sure of the different options. Maybe it's the first time that you've ever had to have a horse put to sleep and you're unsure about the different options, um, what the reasoning um, is behind having your horse put to sleep. Um, there's lots of, there's so many things involved with it um, and, and we can be there to talk you through it, even if euthanasia isn't actually what happens in the end. Um, and something that we strongly advocate, I've put there, is better a week too soon than a day too late. I'm sure it's um, something that, that we've all heard before um, and it's easier said than done, uh, absolutely in that case. So we can offer support and guidance and most importantly information. We're there not to judge, we're completely impartial. Um, we will talk you through about the different methods of euthanasia, um, disposal options, but we will also give you emotional support as well. So you can do that, um, you can access that in different ways. You can either phone us or you can email us. You can speak to train members of staff at BHS HQ, um, or if you like, you can also speak to a trained volunteer who is out in, in your area. So we've got about over 70 BHS trained um, friends at the end who are all volunteers um, out across the UK to provide that support. Um, as I said, we've also got staff at HQ if you just like a phone call. Um, but what's really lovely about having our volunteers out and about is that if you would like someone to be there on the day that your horse is put to sleep, um, we can absolutely try to arrange that. So we really do try to make sure that you have um, a tailored support program that, that feels right for you. This is just some of the lovely feedback that we have had from owners using the service. Um, it's definitely a service that is, we, we're led by the owners on how much or how little contact they would like with us, what they would like from us, whether they would like it with via just email, whether they would like it via um, a telephone, face to face. Um, we really want to make sure that people feel supported at something that is just a completely devastating and an awful time. Um, so we're really, really passionate about making sure that people feel supported when they need it most. So this is something that, that we send out. We send out a little pack of um, seeds with a card and also a poem that was written by one of our um, one of the ladies that, that used the service and she wrote a poem about her pony Milo um, and it's a really beautiful emotive poem um, and we will send out a pack to anyone who uses the service with a card um, but it, it's also available that if you were to know someone that um, you wanted to send a pack to please just get in contact with us and we can send those packs out to you so that um, you can let that person know that you're thinking about them at a time of loss if they have just lost their horse. So it's not just the BHS who has a service like this. Um, we work in conjunction with other charities and organisations to make sure that owners are supported every step of the way. World Horse Welfare have um, a series of leaflets called Just In Case and that really helps you with the planning aspect of euthanasia um, making sure that all of those questions, whys, what ifs, worries are answered um, and it's particularly great if you want to share that action plan with a yard owner if you want to be around. Um, something that I think is a particularly wonderful service that's quite new is the equine end of life service 
So there can be quite a lot of worry um, and misconceptions about um, what collectors um, or NACAMEN are in an area. And what Equine End of Life Service do is you can contact them or you can do a search on their website to see um, what collectors are available in your area. Um, and they will show you who is around. But also what I think is great is the cost for that service as well. Um, so they are fantastic. They've got service standards for the people who come to euthanize and or collect horses. Um, and they, so they make sure that those people are aware that it's an equine collection, which is different from just fallen stock um, because I said they're, they're part of our family. So that's a really fantastic service that they offer. Um, there's our contact details there for friends at the end if you would like those or like to pass them on to anyone. And also Blue Cross have a pet bereavement support service. So again, that's trained um, uh, volunteers and also staff that will be on a, um, a helpline they are absolutely fantastic so if you are feeling like you want some extra support um, or you know of someone that hasn't lost a horse but maybe is struggling with the loss of another pet um, Blue Cross are absolutely fantastic um, and have a brilliant um, flexible opening hours as well so they're open earlier um, and then also later into the evening as well so there really is something for everyone so hopefully no horse owner feels that they have to go through this loss alone own. Um, so please remember that that is there. Um, if it is that you have that the, the sad enough um, situation of losing your horse due to grass sickness or for any other reason in that case. So thank you ever so much for listening um, and I believe we might go on to a Q&A now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sophie. That was really interesting and a, and a, a very difficult subject, um, very sensitively covered. And I think there's lots of, as you say, really good support out there because we're, we're, we're very aware this is quite an emotive subject. I think all of our speakers have touched on that. And we hope that tonight you've had a chance to see that um, we hope that if you are faced with that very, very difficult decision, that if you think about it in advance, that um, something good may come out of it if we can all work together to maybe use some of these very important samples to try and solve this really devastating disease. And there's been a lot of, you've been an absolutely brilliant audience, there's been so much coming through the chat. Um, and lots of really excellent points, which I think we're, we will definitely, I know Kate and Beth have been answering quite a lot of these. Um, and it looks like, certainly from looking through the chat, there's quite a few of you seem very interested to help with the project, which is really fantastic news. Um, Kate has also put up a um, link to a grass sickness book that we put together, which has some of the updates on the research so far and just some facts about grass sickness, which some of you were asking about. And I think uh, tomorrow Kate is also going to put round to all of you attending um, tonight uh, a feedback questionnaire and also how you can get in touch with us if you are interested in maybe becoming um, an owner ambassador with this project. Um, there's quite a lot of you have said you've, you've got quite a lot of information on cases that you had experience of which would be fantastic to hear about. I'm just looking at the time. I know we've probably gone way over time, but it, it was very interesting. I'm just wondering if any of the other speakers tonight, if there's anything else you wanted to add or say at the moment? I think we're all, no. <laughs> well, I'm seeing a few shaking heads, but really to say to all of you, um, thank you so much for joining in um, tonight. Oh, Cathy, sorry, did you want to say something? Um, just yeah, wanted to add that. one thing um, because there was a few questions in regards to um, some of the chronic cases. So we are planning on um, doing a questionnaire just for chronic cases and um, their recovery. So it would be really great if um, yeah, we could get your input in this once we've got it um, up and running. Thanks very much um, for attending tonight. It was really great. Thanks, Cathy. Um, Donald, did you want to say something? I could see. Yes, I uh, yeah. just wanted to say um, that uh, Sylvia uh, is very kindly getting her horses sampled at, at home 
Um, but we have set up this um, scheme um, where if people don't want to do that, then and their own bets are too far away from the fallen stock centres that we, I think, have um, most of Scotland covered now um, mm -hmm. so that the reserve vet, the anonymous vet, can go and do it. Um, because again, on a on a private one person, uh, one person horse, it, it, it's an awful big ask to, to do that at home. Yeah, I think uh, Beth, I think you're listening. I think we would say that um, most of Scotland is covered, is it now? Yeah, are you on Beth? I'm not sure if Beth Beth may be not able to join. Maybe it's a IT issue, but yes, I think you're right, Donald. Um, we've probably got more. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Beth. You uh, can. I'm back. Um, yeah, no, that's right, Donald. We have yeah, most of Scotland now covered and parts of the north of England. What we're really looking for is further down the country as well. So we'd like to get the whole of those sort of eastern counties of England um, from Yorkshire right down to Kent. So if we could have interested owners and vets from that area, that would be fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. Um, and I think we're, as I say, we've got um, lots of, still lots of stuff coming through the chat, which is fantastic. We will try and get to all of you there, but I think I'll maybe just wind it up now because we're, we're, we're a bit over time, but it's been great to have this interaction with you. I, I, I wish we could have maybe done it face to face, and I hope we might be able to do that going forward because we'd like to have fairly regular updates on the project and hope that you can get involved by giving us information maybe giving us some samples, but also we'll keep in touch with, with you about progress for the project. And I'd really like to thank all the speakers tonight who've been fantastic, um, Beth, Cathy, Donald, Sylvia and Sophie. And I'd also really like to thank Kate and Hazel and Luca behind the scenes for um, all the hard work to get this set up. And we are very, very excited about this project, delighted it's being launched. And I think as Donald said, it's really going to be a team approach and we'd very much like uh, all of you to be part of that. So thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope we may hear from you. There's, um, we'll try our best to answer all the questions on, on, on the Q&A tonight. And I think Kate will be in touch with you again to give you a bit more information on how you can get in touch. But thank you very much for joining in tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>